Hey, thank you so much for coming to our, what is this, the third? Uh, Steve and I, we're like old friends now. <laughs> so many times. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's one of those things that is just so, um, um, so important in our industry. I was just telling Shirley that the, the, I was talking on one of my classes about this and a number of the agents said, yeah, we, we've seen the last couple of them and they're really helpful and, and super, uh, you know, super informative and everything else. And my first thought was, wow, people watch these. And then my, my <laughs> second thought was, was this is, it is so important and it is something that is, is useful and helpful for all of us. And uh, we are so lucky to have with us uh, today, Stephen Thomas. Um, and he is the proprietor and the, uh, the brains behind uh, Report on Housing. Um, Report on Housing was started in 2004 as a way to communicate uh, what buyers, sellers, and real estate professionals were experiencing in the trenches, uh, tracking demand, inventory, distressed homes, and market data at both the county and city levels. One of the things that we mentioned um, in my earlier call with my office was how important it is. Um, we as an office have uh, an economist, but he's kind of, uh, he's up in the Washington area and he's really sort of big picture and he, he kind of focuses on that area. And, it, you know, it's nice to see sort of the 30,000 foot level view, but um, what Stephen offers and it is so important is just that real dial down um, specifics of our area. Uh, and we all know that Southern California is a different bird. Um, and, uh, Stephen is a California real estate broker. Again, something that really gives him that extra added oomph. Uh, he's got decades of real estate experience and a degree in quantitative economics and decision sciences. And if you can tell me what that even means, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, <laughs> UC San Diego, uh, and he developed reports on housing and is considered an expert in real estate housing trends. He is on TV, radio, he's in magazines. He is just, he's the, uh, resident expert and the guy you want in your corner. Uh, and we're so lucky to have him in ours. Uh, Stephen, I really appreciate you coming today and uh, let's get going. Sounds good. All right, let's do it. Let's share my screen. All right, here we go. First, of course, we're gonna start off with some fun photos like we always do, because it wouldn't be one of my reports without some fun, funny photos. So I've got a few for us. These are some summer fun photos and these are MLS listings. So I think this is great. <laughs> yeah, wow, wow, that's wow. insane. That yeah, that is, ins that is insane. That is insane. Coffee in that, breakfast, in that morning room. Oh my gosh. Wow, you'll wake up in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> whether you want to or not. Yeah, and then there's this green. It's fantastic. Love it. Or purple. Choose your color, whatever it is. I think if I'm going to wake up in the morning, it's going to be the one that's, that is pow, not that, this purple. That looks like Barney threw up in there. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, because way back when I represented buyers and sellers in the 90s, and I remember showing a house in Ranch San Margarita where everything was like this. Everything was purple and there's nothing you could do about it, but pretty much rip everything out. Because look, it's in the floor. <laughs> How about this? His and her bathtubs. <laughs> well, that, that's probably a clean floor. <laughs> look at the shack carpet. That is gross. And it's, it's a really appropriate color. Oof, gosh, awful. Every realtor right now trying to explain this nutty blank market to their clients. <laughs> <laughs> Through that. Yeah, how about this one? Buy at top of market or wait for crash? This is what everybody is going through right now. And this just drives me nuts, probably the most, which is why I include it, just to make myself crazy. The reason for that is because I don't know what people are looking at. I have, I look at every chart, every stat, and it's not just housing charts, it's everything. And inflation, interest rates, every everything. And what I see, I do not see an end to this. I do not see this crash that people are talking about. I do not see this top of the market that people are talking about, but let's get into it. First, let's, I will do my own brief intro. And she, like she said, quantitative economics decision sciences from UC San Diego, right in your neck of the woods, 30 years in the business, Orange County native, Capitol Valley High School grad, lots and lots of kids. 
avid runner. I brought six. We're a Brady Bunch family. The six on the right. My wife brought two. The two on the left. I adopted her. She adopted mine. And there we go. Three and a half years old. I'm going to tell you this right now. People say it's the terrible twos. I've done a lot of research right here. It's the terrible threes. <laughs> It really is. That's when they learn to talk and also learn to do tantrums in the middle of a grocery store. That's threes. Uh, then we have, uh, we've been all over the press, like uh, Nancy was mentioning. Um, our company is Reports on Housing. The plural report, Reports on Housing, your local real estate snapshot. It, we really are about driving home a lot of data and giving you the power. Even if you're brand new in the business, after reading these reports, you can articulate exactly what's going on in the marketplace and sound like you have command over it. Not everybody has an opinion on real estate, but nothing is really uh, based in facts and data and stuff like that. It's the real, the real data, the real facts. It really does give you power to articulate what's going on. And even if you're, like I said, brand new in the business, it makes it sound like you've been in the business for decades when, when you can uh, talk about what's going on as far as statistics are concerned. Then of course we have, uh, uh, we're, we're not focusing on the past, the rear view mirror. We're not looking at closed sales data as much uh, and, and in detail. Instead, we're looking at out of our windshield what is the supply, available number of homes to show? What is demand, a snapshot of 30 days worth of escrow activity? And from that, we're able to give you the speed of the market. Uh, we are, Our reports are used for the listing presentation, for getting price reductions, for getting buyers off the fence. It's really about just another tool in your arsenal so that you can close more transactions. It's about setting expectations for everybody because everybody has a wacky idea of what's going on in real estate from your neighbors to your doctors, to your dentists, to soccer coaches, you name it. Everybody's got a big bad opinion on real estate, even though we... We're the ones in the trenches and we have the data and st stats and facts. We're we dot all over Southern California and I'm um, looking at expanding into the Bay Area and maybe even Arizona and Nevada that's coming up. And uh, the reports, some of them that we've had recently, uh, starting in April, waiting will be costly, talks about all these people that say that they're going to wait. This explains why it's not a good idea. Crash coming. We're gonna talk about this crash thing. Crash coming, the answer is no. And there is a lot of significant data and charts that show exactly why it's not coming. Is housing unaffordable? This is, uh, it really is not because of where interest rates are. You have to understand people like to compare values to where they were before, even prior to the Great Recession, where we of course have higher incomes now. Uh, one, one of the differentiating factors and we have lower interest rates. That means you can afford more home. So even with the values higher than where they were prior to the Great Recession, you can't say that uh, that that uh, values are too high. So uh, summer transition, I did a report on that. I'm going to do another one on uh, on the fall transition that's coming up. Not a good time to buy. We hear this by from everybody. This is uh, what is it? It's 81% of all buyers feel it's not a good time to buy. You know what? They're right. It's very, very difficult to buy. But if they go through the process, it is a smart bet. It's a really good move. So that's really what this is about. As far as it being not a good time to buy, it doesn't mean that we're at a height. It just means it's very difficult. That's really what, 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 what that st statistic says to me more than anything else, because it really is a good time to purchase. Permanently parked. So people aren't moving it as often as everybody would like. Everybody heard CAR and NAR talk about once every five to seven years, that's what everybody likes to quote. Then it was, I don't know if you've seen it more recently, it's like once every 10 years that they're saying, but they're only interviewing people that successfully closed escrow. They are not interviewing those people that say, I am never ever moving. They, those people will never ever be interviewed. So because of that, they, uh, it, it looks like the turnover rate is a lot higher. And that's why CAR R and NAR did it because it sounds like it's the turnover is a lot more. Really, when you take the sheer number of units available in, in, in uh, uh, like San Diego County, all detached and attached, that's total. There were 761,000 units. Last year, we sold 37,302. 
Uh, that, that's a turnover rate of 4.9%, which is once every 20 years that people are moving. And you're better than Orange County is at once every 24 years, and LA is once every 28 years. This is right. This is statistically sound. This is not a survey. This is exactly what it is. This is how often we're moving. People said, so what was it before? I think before it was about once every 12 years. That's where we were before the uh, Great Recession. Great Recession happened and come out of this is people do not move as often as they did. This is a trend that's been around since 2010 and it has not changed. It has legs, will not change anytime soon. People are living in their homes longer, like as if we're a European nation at this point. That's kind of the mentality as the population gets older. Uh, the most recent one that came out, a matter of fact, San Diego County just got this last night. It's called Forbearance, Foreclosures, Facts. And it goes into the distressed market and why we're not going to have a wave of foreclosures. So uh, you can go to reportsonhousing.com and click on subscribe and we'll send you the, the most recent one on no wave of foreclosures, forbearance and uh, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, we'll send you the most recent report. It's emailed to you. At the very bottom, there's a bunch of, uh, of links that you can click on to get uh, one that you can print out, one that you can copy, cut, edit, paste, add your logo, Excel spreadsheets, ton of this, uh, these things, excerpts for public facing websites and social media. We also have a ton of charts. If you click on the charts thing, I print out all of it and, and bind it and make it my, all the data on San Diego County uh, uh, housing so that when you show up, they can't refute it. You've got all the data. They're not gonna read all of it anyways. Every two weeks, this thing comes out. So uh, we also have an infographics links link at the bottom that's new this year you can you can customize it at the bottom there's a whole bunch of jpegs also that we we do every single report uh about something that you can focus on and slap up into social media so that's also a new feature it's 15 dollars per month 150 dollars per year you get a month free if you utilize the coupon code san diego without a space that's just for you guys san diego and let's get into the housing market. We're going to dive right on in. And, and as far as the housing market, yes, insanity, right? It has been insane. There's two reasons for this. And I need to add a, add a picture. One of them is actually COVID. COVID caused the inventory to be lower than, than and people not to come on the market. And uh, so that it really suppressed an inventory that was already low. So we have, it, it made this supply problem even worse. And then we had interest rates that got to record lows, which made demand even more heightened. So this is a supply and demand issue. And if you don't believe me on interest rates, here we go. Here are the rates. We're at 2.77%. That is the, the, the latest thing, 2.77%. That was last Thursday. This comes out every week. Freddie Mac's primary mortgage market survey does a survey across the United States. And it's getting closer to the all-time record of 2.65% hit during the first week of January. We got all the way up to 3.18%. You can see that blue line. We got all the way up to 3.18% and it was going the right direction. And I was so relieved. And then it went the other direction and kept on going. So, and part of that has to do with um, this uh, COVID and and uh, this Delta virus, as well as we, you, there, there have been, uh, uh, other other factors to, to, to get into, like the, the overall economy wasn't as robust as people thought it was going to be. I still think it was it's quite robust and has a lot of legs. But uh, this is what where people want to park their money is in long term bets. And if we had an inflation problem, we'd have higher interest rates. Just understand that. So uh, this is very, very low at 2.77%. This beats what everybody's expectations of where interest rates were going to be. It's very, very hard to nail interest rates. Very difficult. And it's one of those things that even when we keep on doing uh, projections, we kind of are off. NAR thought we'd be at 3.2% right now. We're not even close to 3.2%. And uh, Freddie Mac at 3.3%, the Mortgage Bankers Association, this is what they do, thought 3.6% right now. So you can see how far off we are. We needed to be here, I thought, in order for us to slow down a little bit. We're not, we're lower, which means we're hotter than where I'd like to be. And you've seen this before. Uh, this is Case Schiller. If you see this on the right-hand side, nationally, it has never been this high since Case Schiller started in 1988. 
they did composite 10 year and composite 20 year, but uh, uh, composite 20, composite 10, it's just a number of different metros. The national index is really what you wanna follow. And uh, it's up 17% year over year. And I'd argue that uh, like in your neck of the woods, San Diego, you guys are like north of 20% year over year right now. So not, uh, I, I, I don't think that's a good thing. Uh, if you're a homeowner, it's fantastic, but it's going up way too fast and, and it will erode affordability extremely fast. We compare this to 2012 and 2013. That's the other, that, that area that I, that I just circled. And that is where we went way up. And what I was hoping for was what happened in 2013. We had interest rates that went up during the summertime. We had the exact opposite. So that's what happened. 2013, uh, we had interest rates go up. So we started to see the level of appreciation come down. The problem with the, on the right-hand side is we are juicing the uh, housing market by interest rates continuing to drop. And uh, oops, so let's, we'll go past that. So anyways, <laughs> values are really high. If you look at, it's really a supply and demand issue and values are, are screaming upwards and they are unhealthy. It, it, when I say it's unhealthy, I just, it's because it's eating into affordability. We can't do this for too long and uh, it's not fueling a bubble. It's not gonna cause a housing crash. That's not what the problem is. The problem is in California, we're getting too expensive for my kids to stay here and buy real estate. That's going to be a real issue. That's more of why I'm rooting for it to slow down. It's, it's just for the overall health of the California housing market. As far as equity gains are concerned, if you look on the uh, left-hand side, this is just through the first quarter of 2021, California has uh, increased by $70,000 this is year over year equity gain and uh, Idaho is 71,000, that's on average. So we're number two behind Idaho as far as the amount of equity gain in our properties. And I wanna talk really quick about economic cycles. People say that the market is supposed to do these cycles once every 10 years or whatever it is, that's a bunch of bunk. What it really does is something it does every year. It, it depends upon many other factors as to when the market slows and, and when the market turns and becomes a buyer's market. A lot of different factors of which I'm not seeing any in, in any, anything that I'm looking at. Instead, what I'm seeing is this seasonal transition. There's a seasonality effect to real estate. And really, this doesn't do it justice. There's really five seasons. Spring is the best. That is when we uh, get the, the highest demand and then inventory starts to rise. Then we get into summer, which is where we are today. That's the second best. Then we get to autumn, that's third best. And then we get to winter. It's actually, there should be one right before winter called holidays. Holidays, that's when the inventory drops like a rock, demand drops like a rock. Everybody forgets about real estate. People say, I have my best month ever in December. That was from the month of October and the first half of November that you place into escrow that closes in December. You're not having a good December as far as the number of escrows are concerned, because I can show you historically, it's not a good month for new escrow activity. So December uh, it, it, it is still the holiday market. Then we get into the winter market, which is January, February, March. And people go, yeah, it's really busy then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, that's when demand goes up, but we have the inventory that stays flat. So we don't have a lot of homeowners that want to place their homes on the market in January and February. They want to wait till when? Spring. That's really what the bottom line is. So, so we're in summer right now. And this is what I did that one report on. Summer is where inventory climbs and then uh, we get demand drops slightly during that time period. And people are going, why? Why does this happen? And that's because we take the gas pedal off of demand a little bit. Kids are out of school. That's uh, first, and with me, that's a lot. We have uh, many kids that are off from school. And then we have uh, travel. We go ahead and do our little traveling, especially this year, because we didn't really get much of a summer last year. We have uh, sports are now open for business this year compared to last year. We also can go back to uh, amusement parks. We can go play at the beach. You can go play at the pool. I don't know if you've been to the beach or the pool, it's a bit more crowded than it was last year. These are distractions. Enough buyers that have written so many offers wanna go enjoy themselves, they'll pause their activity. Well, enough people 
pause across the board where it brings demand down a little bit and we see the inventory as a result rise. And then we're gonna transition, we're about to hit it. My kid just went back to Washington State University this week and uh, kids are going back to school. I think it's one third of the country will be back in school by the end of this week. And then it becomes two, two thirds at least, or even higher than that, uh, by the time we get to the end of next week. And then everybody's back to school the following week is pretty much the, the way that it works. So this is the month of August. And when we kids go back to school, that is what I call the fall market. And that is where we get the inventory starting to come down from its height that we reached in, this, in the summertime because it's not the most opportune time to move a family. So that's when we start, that starts to come down. And at the same time, it, there's a wane in, de, in uh, demand as well. So demand falls. So let's look at the San Diego County supply. And this is where the inventory is. You can see we were lower earlier this year. We got to a really low value and we have come up since, those really, since that really low value. And uh, on August 5th, we hit 3,100. This is last 30, 180 homes. There was only, there was really no change. It was up eight homes in a two week period. That's hardly any kind of a change. Last year, we were at 4,180. That was 31% more, exactly an extra thousand uh, homes on the market, right? 31% more. And, but it, the three year average is really what we got to look at because last year is a COVID year and it messed with the data. That wasn't even normal. We were really low last year at this time. We're just lower right now. The three year average is 7,083. We need to be at 7,000 homes in the market. We're at 3,180. We need a lot more homes. So you could see that's more than double where we are today. And that is uh, a, we're just really, really low. The lowest level was achieved on April 1st and San Diego County, I didn't even understand it. 2,175 for the giant size of your county. That's all that we had on the market. That was nothing. Since then, we've had this elevation through spring and then summer and it's up 46% since. So you can kind of see, we peak typically between July and the end of August. What uh, I was hoping for is that, that interest rates would rise. And if that happened, we would get a, a, uh, some people that would overprice and they wouldn't be, be able to get their, their uh, they, they wouldn't be able to get their value because more people start uh, getting a little bit more wishy-washy as interest rates get, uh, go up and they're higher. So if we had three and a half percent interest rates, we would have followed this line. We would have had inventory that continues to climb and we don't peak until the uh, until sometime in the fall. However, because interest rates are dropping, it's it, it, my, my viewpoint has totally changed. And I think that we're reaching a peak right now in the inventory, a peak at this ridiculously low level, which means that we will continue to remain flat. And then once we get to Thanksgiving, there are still people out there that are overpriced that stay in the market a little bit longer. Those are the kind of people that cancel and expire or withdraw come the holidays. And then it comes down, which means I believe we have a very big chance that next year to start uh, to start uh, <clears throat> the start of the year at 2022, we will have fewer homes on the market than ever before, even fewer than this year, which will put us behind the eight ball. So, and if you, you think uh, it's a supply and demand thing, so what do you think is going to happen with low interest rates and a very, very small supply, which is even less than what we started off this year, we're in for quite the spring of 2022. And I don't care what people are saying that it's still that it's so expensive out there. I've heard from so many people, if you're priced below a million dollars, what happens? You get 50 groups, uh, 50 different showings. Uh, and I've heard that from open houses. Uh, I still hear it or like last weekend. This doesn't sound like a market that's slowing down like the news is portraying it right now. It's still extremely busy out there. Even if we used to have 75 uh, people through, now we have 50 people through, that's still 50 people that are taking a look at a, at a house. So uh, there's just not that many homes in the market. And uh, to give you an idea, I'm doing a three-year average from 2017 to 2019. I throw out 2020 because it doesn't make sense, but the number of new four cell signs to hit San Diego County. For the first half of 2021, you guys are down 15% compared to that three-year average. You're missing 4,477 four cell signs. That's a lot. And you're... 
It is the second most of all of Southern California. San Diego has had a real problem with homeowners placing their homes in the market than anywhere else. And in July, down 7%, so not quite as bad, down 363 homes. You're, that, that doesn't sound like a lot when you're talking all of, uh, of San Diego County. However, the problem is we don't have enough homes on the market. So every single home that doesn't come on the market compared to the average hurts our cause of trying to, uh, of trying to uh, get more inventory, which has been a real problem at this point, I would call it a inventory crisis. COVID-19 is not the issue, even though we, we we're gonna get more people that are gonna start to use that as, a, as an excuse of why they don't place their home on the market. But underlying, if people wanna sell their house, they can. We're already used to wearing a mask and doing everything we can. It's not COVID-19 that's keeping people from placing their homes on the market. It's the fact that home values are going up so much. Homeowners know that. However, they know if they sell, they have to go purchase. And that's the hard part is going to purchase because where will I go? I don't want to be stuck. So we have to uh, provide them an answer as to how we're going to do that. And we can do that as, as uh, real estate practitioners and tell them that there's different ways of doing it with rent backs and different, different things. There's a slew of things that we can give them strategy wise, but we have to answer this because this is what the general public is worried about is where will I go? And they also know that, hey, you know what? I'm not in a rush because the value of my home's going up. They know that they're sitting back right now and they have, everybody takes a look at, oh, what am I on Zillow? Uh, you know what? They'll go find exactly how much their value is and they look at it and they go, look at it. It's gone up like $50,000 in the last six months. Fantastic. Yay for me. So th that's what they're doing. They're just sitting back and they know that they don't have to rush because their values are going up. Even if they go up in value, they're losing out because <laughs> if you... If you did a postcard on talking about, yeah, values go up 10% over the next year and you need to move up, the best thing to do is to move now because if you have a home at $750,000, 10% up is seven hundred and is seven, uh, $75,000. 10% of a million dollars of what you want to move to is $100,000. You sit there and wait, you lose twenty five grand by waiting in, in uh, appreciation. So let's look at San Diego demand. Yes, this is the last 30 days worth of new escrow activity. And I'm telling you, it's still extremely nuts. And the fuel to this is, are these low interest rates. So, uh, and I know that out there, it's a total auction-like atmosphere. I, I've told everybody, they go, how high should we go above the asking price? I don't know. It's, it's kind of like when you go, uh, it's how badly do you want it? I would back, factor in, what is a comfortable payment that you're comfortable with and what is the maximum value that you can you can purchase and then look a little bit lower and be willing to go to that. That is what you're willing to pay. Somebody might be willing to pay more. You're going to have to go back to the drawing board. My hairstylist, who I was con convinced to go shop for a house starting in December, ended up closing on something in June. He wrote 100 offers. And every time I got and once a month, I got to get this these locks trimmed and I'd sit in the chair and I'd tell them over and over again, hey, you know what, keep at it, keep at it. If you have to take a break, take a week break, take a two week break, but just go back at it because you do not want to miss out on this. Soul over asking, that is the flavor of the year. And if you think it looks like it's slowing down, well, take a look at this. This was as of June, this is done by California Association of Realtors. Did you know that 71.4% of all closings in the state of California that's all of California sold above their asking price. That's 71.4%. So you tell me if it's slowing down. San Diego County demand year over year, last 30 days worth of escrow activity. On August 5th, last Thursday, it was at 3,320, went down 2%, shed 54 pending sales. So it's, it's the tra trajectory is down. Last year, we were at 4,005 at this time, 21% more. You can't compare this year to last year because look at the green line. During the springtime, we did diddly squat. During the summertime, that became our spring. So when you're looking at last year, you're going, well, it was better last year. Well, yeah, it was a little bit better last year because if you remember, we didn't do anything in March and April. So uh, we had a really good March and April this year so that you could see it's a normal line where we peak during the springtime. The th three year average from 2017 to 2019 is 3,271. That's only 1% less than where we are today. My argument for San Diego County is your your pending statistics would be higher if you place more homes in the market, but you guys have the biggest problem. 15% fewer homes in the market means uh, uh, fewer escrows as well. 
The peak was on June 10th, 3,584. It's gone down, it's down 7% since. So you guys have peaked uh, at the start of June. And if you look, this is pretty much, you peaked a little bit late, but it's pretty much, this is the average is between the second week of April through the uh, third week of May. You guys did it in June, but nonetheless, that's when you typically peak and we're gonna be coming down for the rest of the year. We're not gonna go up higher and meet the spring peak. This is you, the, the best time of the year is done as far as pending sales activity is concerned. And from here, we're just gonna methodically, slowly but surely go down. Then we're gonna hit the holidays. And that's where the purple line, green line, all that dive always happens right after Thanksgiving, second week of November. So the, how fast is the market moving? How fast is this tricked out cart going? I'm telling you, it's fast. On August 5th, last Thursday, we were at 29 days. It was up a day. So it was at 28 days, two weeks prior in July. And now it's at 29 days for all of uh, San Diego County. Last year, it was at 31 days at this time. So very close to where we are today. So the feeling right now is the feeling we started getting last summer. And the three-year average that 2017, 2019 is 66 days, more than double where we are today. So you, you feel how hot the market is right now compared to the average. The low was achieved on April 1st at 19 days. You guys have gone up 10 days since. So if you remember what it was like in April, it was harder than it is now. You've got a little bit of relief, but still the problem is anytime you're below 40 day expected market time, it's a crazy, insane market. And that's where you guys have been behaving for a while. And if you look at this, between the blue and the black is actually what we refer to as a, uh, as a slight seller's market. That's where we were in 2019 because we came out of 2018 with high interest rates. We built up an inventory and we didn't really do much of appreciation in 2019. Below the blue line is a hot seller's market. The further below you get, like, like I said, below 40 is where it's absolutely crazy. And this, the, my bars are off. I should have done it. This is probably from Orange County. But anyways, above uh, 90 to 120 is balanced. That's, some people are saying that we're in a balanced market. I just listened to a podcast that said we were in a balanced market. That's a bunch of bunk. A balanced market would be where buyers are able to take their time. I can guarantee you none of your buyers are taking their time below $1.25 million. I, I just know it. And uh, so where is the expected market time going to go? I thought it was going to go slowly but surely up and slow ourselves down so we get, can get to 40 days by the end of the year with a uh, with the market with more inventory coming on. But because we're not going to get more inventory staying on the, and stagnating on the marketplace because of these low interest rates, it's going to remain flat. We are going to remain at around 30 day expected market time for the remainder of the year and start off next year day one with a very, very uh, hard, uh, difficult market. So in Vista, you guys have a 30 day expected market time. That it was 28 last year at this time. And last year is going to sound very much like this year because it was already insane last year at this time. That was where the insanity really began. And uh, Oceanside, 23 days last year at 25 days. Carlsbad at 28 days last year at 34 days. Encinitas at 36 days last year was at 37. That's Candido today is at 25 days. Last year was at 20. San Marcos is at 22 days, last year's at 21. Valley Center is at 42 days, last year was at 62. And Bonsa is at 21 day versus 38 days last year. So you could see across the board, it is, it, it's extremely hot. It was hot last year. If I compare this to a couple of years back, you'd see the big fat difference, but I just wanted to show you where you are at right now. It's insanity everywhere uh, over there. Valley Center is the only one that's close, a little bit above that 42 days, which makes it a little bit of a breathing room, not much. Home values are escalating and they're going to continue to escalate for the rest of the year. And there really is no end to sight, uh, no end in sight to this. I told you I'm looking at all the different charts and data. My, my instrument panel shows all systems go for the housing market, it's not gonna change. So uh, let's go into this housing crash that everybody's talking about. Oh yes, housing crash. Are we gonna have one? Why are they talking about this? Because home values are absolutely soaring upwards and we're panicking where everybody's going, well, this has to, we can't do this again. You can't sustain this rate. It's absolutely incredible uh, the way that it's going up so fast. So it has to, 
fall apart. Just has to. That I don't want to purchase at the very, very top. I remember the pain of the Great Recession and that sunburn. It was awful. Man, it was awful. And I'm telling you, as a result, everybody is Googling housing crash. I've actually looked up the term. There's a, you can go to Google Trends and see what's trending uh, as far as uh, searches are concerned. And this is housing crash. 100 means that's where people are uh, searching it the most. And you, this goes back in time. And you can see this was at the start of the pandemic last year. People were talking about a housing crash. Now they're talking about a housing crash even more than the start of the pandemic. Right now, everybody's talking about it. Go to YouTube, look up housing crash. A bunch of knuckleheads will tell you why we're having a housing crash. And I'm sorry for that term. However, they are knuckleheads because they are investors or there are people that are rooting for it to go bad. Those are the people that are trying to get you to pay them money so you can get their system for investing and stuff like that. They have no idea how to read economic charts and they're not looking at a whole bunch of economic charts. They're typically looking at one thing. There's a bunch of people that are talking about the pending Duma foreclosures and and short sales and stuff like that. And I can tell you the people that are screaming the loudest are the people that have represented asset management companies that did short sales during the, uh, uh, during the Great Recession. Those are the people that are talking the loudest and that's because they have skin in the game. That's what they're rooting for. However, I can't see it in the numbers. Bubble, people are looking at bubble. They looked at it like crazy back in 2016. I'm not sure why way back then. They were obviously wrong, right? And then you flash forward to today and uh, people were looking at housing bubble quite a bit recently this year. Now it's more housing crash than bubble. And uh, then I looked up housing supply and demand and it looks like an EKG. That means that three people were looking at it one day, then zero people. Nobody's really searching this. And I can show you why. This is us right now. This is really stacking the popularity of each of the searches on top of each other. And you can see what's most popular on the right-hand side. It is housing crash. Everybody is talking about this big housing crash coming. And they're not really talking that much about housing bubble compared to housing crash. And they're definitely, oops, on the right-hand side, down at the bottom, you can see that green line. Yeah, that's housing supply and demand. Yeah, they're not looking at the fundamentals of why we're having this issue of a hot housing market. Instead, they're just projecting their housing crash out there into the universe. And uh, I'm gonna tell you why it's not going to happen. I understand CPI actually came out today and the core CPI was lower than what their expectations were. And it's gonna go away by the time we get to next year. So this is very transitory. People like to talk about this and say that this is the reason that we're going to have a housing crash. And I'm going to tell you this right now, the, all these long-term investors, this is what they do. They follow the economic charts like I do. They don't believe that this is long -term, a long-term problem. Everybody instead remembers this is the highest level since November of 91. They remember back to the 70s. The 70s, I remember. I remember my mom and dad getting in line uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Sundays because they had an odd license plate. That's what you had to do in order to get gasoline. It was even numbers were on certain days of the week, odds were on the other days of the week. If you had a vanity, that was an even number. I remember those days and that was where we had a real issue. You think Costco's lines are long for gas? You should have seen what it was like back then. There was a real problem, it was a supply and demand issue across the board and we had accelerating, uh, we had a, a accelerating inflation for many other reasons as well. And we weren't much, as big of a global economy either. And uh, really what's causing this issue that we're experiencing right now is the short-term supply chain problem. We've seen it in lumber and global chip shortages. With lumber is where we went screaming upwards, but you didn't hear a lot about how it's come screaming downward. And instead people go to Home Depot and say, hey, Stephen, prices are still really high. And that's because a lot of people bought at the height, the height these suppliers, and they've supplied uh, Home Depot and everybody else, these high prices, and they have to offload them at the high prices that they paid for them. So it takes a while for it to trickle down to builders and Home Depot and Lowe's and all that stuff. So there is a lag. And uh, used cars is one of the biggest factors in, in this uh, issue. And this issue has, it's not just used cars and new cars. It is also, uh, it is also chips. They, they have a lot to do with this problem. 
And one of the biggest issues is a lot of people are going, going back to work and there aren't as many new homes, uh, new cars that are going to uh, use cars and there aren't that many used cars. So that's been a real problem. Part of it is these car rental agencies uh, for the travel industry. They got rid of their fleets of, of uh all their fleets of cars when we went into the pandemic because they couldn't sit on all that inventory and it do nothing. So what they did is they sold it all off. Well, they sold it all off and then we had a, a big boom in, in travel this year and their rental fleets were gone. So they had to replace them. They wanted to buy new, new cars, they couldn't. Why? Because chips, chips go into new cars and there's been a chip problem. So chips have been an issue. And also the issue has, uh, so they've been going out and buying used cars. And when you and I are trying to find a used car, we're having a real problem. And, and I've heard of people that have turned in their lease and they've turned it into like CarMax and they've sent them a check uh, and, and either turning in their lease, they actually get a check back from CarMax because they want to be able to sell that, that, uh, that used car. So that is a real issue. And also when we went into the pandemic, everybody started getting personal computers and, and and uh, cameras and all these things that required small chips. And keep in mind that some of these factories were hit. They were hit by uh, the pandemic and they had to close down their factories. So their inventories were depleted and they can't keep up with it. The demand, well, they're eventually going to get back up to where they need to be. And it'll be like, just like the vaccine, there was a demand problem at the very beginning and you had to wait to get it. And now you can go into your local CVS and go get a shot today if you need to get the vaccine. That's gonna be the same thing with the chips next year in 2022. But if you see what's the biggest culprit as far as uh, in inflation problems are car and truck rentals, used cars and trucks. Those are where we see the biggest inflation issue and they factor into this and they're a big piece of the puzzle. Very, very, inflation is extremely transitory at this point. Some of this stuff will stick and it's kind of like gasoline prices when they go up, it takes a long time for them to come down and then they kind of stick high. Some of that's gonna be uh, sticking around for uh, a little bit longer and things are gonna cost us a little bit more but understand that it's not gonna be this trajectory where it continues to go up like the 1970s. July job reports. I got this from, it's called JOLTS. And uh, that's, uh, if you saw that, this came out last Friday. This was actually a beat of the estimate. 943,000 was supposed to be in the eights. That was the, the monthly job growth gain in, in the month of July. And unemployment as a result fell to 5.4%. You can see it's coming down quite a bit. And our job recovery, as far as the number of jobs missing, we're at only down 5.7 million uh, people. When we first went in this pandemic, at first it was over 20 million. And now we're at 5.7 million. You can see that this is coming back by the time we get to a year from now, this thing will be flush. We'll be at the same point we were prior to the pandemic. And that is where we have one of the healthiest job markets uh, in like uh, since I was born. So over 50 years. And as far as unemployed, number of unemployed persons per job opening, there are more jobs than there are unemployed at this point. That, it, it hit uh, 10 million as far as the number of job openings are concerned, and there's a lot of quits. There's more people quitting right now than ever before. Just know that's because right now, the worker is a, has the upper hand for the first time in a very long time, which is why we're getting a lot of people quitting and a lot of people hesitating on where they're going to move uh, to or where they're going to uh, get a job. And that's because the job market is extremely hot right now. And it will remain hot for quite some time. I also want to show you this stat, the pandemic they went back and they, they gauged how long the, uh, the uh, recession lasted. And they're, now they're saying it lasted only two months. It's a razor thin recession. And that's because we shut down the economy, then opened it back up. If you compare that to the Great Recession, which everybody remembers that burn, we were in that recession for 18 months. So nearly two years, that's a year and a half. So that's a long time that we were in the recession. So, uh, and then as far as equity is concerned, if you see this, we, this bump in the middle, that's where we got a lot of equity in our houses and mortgage debt also increased almost at that same rate. And the reason that it went up is because of subprime and pick a payment loans and fog and mirror dogs and dead people got uh, loans. And so it was creating this artificial demand, which created this artificial equity because one, once this thing imploded, it imploded. And if you look on the right 
hand side, this is since the Great Recession, everybody has to qualify for loans and there's a lot of down payment, uh, high down payments, and a lot of cash involved. And if you look at the amount of equity in the housing stock, that's on the right hand side right now. We don't have a lot more mortgage debt. We have a lot more equity. Very, very strong underpinnings of the housing market. And what fueled the Great Recession was a credit bubble. And you can see that was credit. That was the number of mortgage purchases uh, applications. It just absolutely skyrocketed from 2002 all the way till this thing came undone. Around 2005 is where it peaked. And that's, I knew in 2005 that we had a problem. And if you compare that to what the, uh, where we are as far as credit, uh, the number of purchase applications going up from 2015 to where we are today, it's a nice, even, uh, slightly upward trajectory, not at all like the credit bubble that we, that we had prior to the Great Recession. And there's no slim shady lending going on. So there's no shady lending that is currently going on out there. Uh, yes, you can get subprime, but if you look at the details of how you have to qualify for a subprime, I would take on that loan. I would personally invest in some of these subprime loans because they have a higher return and the qualifications are still extremely hard for subprime. And as far as mortgage originations by credit score, look at the number of uh, of dollars that are done uh, with very, very high credit, 760 plus. That is the lion's share of who's getting loans right now. If you look at subprime, it's this, or not subprime, below 620, it's just a tiny little fraction. You have to have good credit. And uh, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a very, very healthy housing stock on this slide as well. The real issue, it's not, I just showed you all the different slides. It comes down to supply and demand. And prior to the Great Recession, I'm going to show you Orange County because I go all the way back to 2004. I don't have that in San Diego County. I can project and I know where, where, uh, where you guys were, kind of but I don't have the actual stats, but I'm gonna show you because all the uh, Southern California markets and across the country did very, very something very, very similar. It all came down to the same thing. If you can see this, this is in 2005. I knew we had a problem when we went to from uh, 4,900 homes on the market to over 8,000 homes in the market by the time we got to the, uh, to the fall, over 8,000. Then we started off 2006 with uh, about 7,200 homes on the market. We finished 2006 with 16,000 homes on the market. So more than doubled. And then we started off the next year with uh, 12,000 homes in the market and got up to 18,000 homes on the market. Orange County has 2,300 homes on the market. That's it right now. And there was 18,000. So you could see this was a supply issue. I knew in 05, 06, and even prior to it crashing in 07, the real problem was supply and demand. We had way too much supply and it took two years for this thing to come unhinged. So, and as far as forbearance is concerned, I hear about this all the time as well. It's a big fat yawner for me. Deep, and I've been talking about this for months and months and months and watching this thing go down. It decreased last week from 3.47% to 3.40%. There are only 1.7 million uh, borrowers that are in forbearance across the United States of America. And uh, there were 4.3 million in June. And 87% of the 1.7 million people that remain in forbearance have at least 10% equity. What does that tell you? If they needed to sell, they can contact you to sell their home and not become a short sell or foreclosure statistic. That's what that says. So if you do the math, 10% or it's 13% uh, uh, th have less than 10% equity. We're only talking 220,000 people that may have a problem that remain in forbearance right now. And the people that have exited, because we've had over 7.3 million people in uh, forbearance, uh, or actually 7.2 million, 5.2 million have exited forbearance. The people that were removed and are performing, that is they're out of forbearance and they're performing 3.4 million, 65% are actually performing fine on their loans out of the 5.2 million. Another 1.3 million uh, removed and paid off, which means they refinanced or they, uh, they sold their house. That's 25%. 
So that's 90% either removed or performing or paid off their loan. And then how about this? Three, how about the people that are out, they exited, but they're delinquent and they're working with the workout unit right now. They're coming up with some sort of a modification of their terms or they're working out a payment plan or they're gonna place that the amount that they owe at the end of the uh, loan. They're doing something, that's 333,000. There are only 195,000 of the 5.2 million people that are right now delinquent. Does that sound like a wave of foreclosures of 195? No. So if you do the math on it, it doesn't look like we're gonna get that many foreclosures at the, at the end of this thing in short sales. Contrary to what everybody says, there's not going to be a wave of foreclosures. Instead, we're, there, there's so much equity and the equity will continue. The home price expectations are for it to go up on average over the next five years, 23.4%. Well, we're doing that faster than what this slide is saying. It's probably closer to 34% over the next five years. Things should slow down eventually as values get up to a point where it is even uh, hard for interest rates to go up to three and a quarter percent. And I'll demonstrate that because really what my biggest concern is affordability. And it's not that all of a sudden we're going to ping upwards and hit four and three quarters percent like the University of Chapman in my neck of the woods said, and we're going to have, uh, and, and we're in a housing bubble. They couldn't be more wrong because we're going to have interest rates that stay and are sticky at a right around three percent. That's the issue. And affordability is the issue. Mortgage rate sensitivity is, is our issue. We're, it's kind of like as we get older, our teeth become more sensitive. Well, the longer uh, values continue to go up, our sensitivity to higher interest rates uh, goes up. And if you remember in the year 1990, we had interest rates at 10%. That is, we could not stomach 10% right now. Then in 2000, they were 8%. We could not stomach 8%. Then prior to the Great Recession, we were at 6.35%. We can't even tolerate 6.35%. I heard a lot of millennials when in, 19, in uh, 2018, when we had interest rates that reached 5%, they were going, that's it. This market is going to hell in a handbasket. We have interest rates of 5%. And yet we remember these, uh, these higher interest rates, but they are right. Five percent, yes, exactly. Yeah, I remember back in the day, 18%, nearly 20% back in uh, seven, uh, what was it, 81. So yeah, that was a real problem. If you wanna see what interest rates are, go look at 18.1% is what they hit. 5% uh, interest rates was the sensitivity and they were right. In 2018, it was 5%. My argument is it's no longer 5%. If interest rates hit 4%, that would, that would, uh, uh, decelerate our market a lot. But I was hoping that we were going to go up in in, uh, in mortgage rates so that we could slow this market down. And yet we've had the reverse happen. So as a result, we have appreciation continuing at an astronomical rate. So it's at 3.75%. And I think that by the time we get to the end of the year, we're going to be at 3.5%. 3.5%, if we had interest rates at 3.5%, it's enough to decelerate our market to the point where we're going to kind of hit more of a balance. Not a buyer's market. I repeat, not a buyer's market. When I say slow, I'm talking about going from 120 miles per hour to like 45. That's a balanced market. You're still going to get there. You're not going as fast as you want to go, but and you're not stopped like uh, gridlock. Gridlock is a deep buyer's market. That's what we, we had in, in the Great Recession. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just decelerating our market. And our market has decelerated from, from uh, as we saw in San Diego County when we were at 18 days uh, a, back in April. It's decelerated from 18 days, which is like 140 miles per hour. And now we're going 110 miles per hour. We're still speeding. It's still a very, very hot seller's market. It's just not as acutely of a hot seller's market as it was back on April 1st. So market overview, and then I can answer some questions. Here we go. Just know that the strongest demographic patch of first time home buyers, 32 year olds, there are, is a great number of them. It started last year. This year is its peak and it goes for the next three years. It's very, very strong. It's not something that we've seen anytime recently. So uh, in decades. So we have more fuel to the fire with first time home buyers. And this is the number of of uh, closed sales 
San Diego County did its own thing. It's kind of done its own thing because of the lack of number of homes on the market. And you're going to read this in the San Diego Tribune, so just be prepared for it. Year over year, you actually are closed fewer transactions this year compared to last year's down 3%. So uh, I, I talked to that, that your reporter down at San Diego Tribune. Hopefully he doesn't make too big of a story out of it. But it's not him typically, it's the editors that create the, the uh, headlines. And they're the ones that make it sound like doom and gloom. So you're at 3,726. You can see the purple line was two years ago. The orange line was the year prior to that. It is a still extremely strong July. It's just not as strong as last, last year. Uh, July, we were already starting to hit really good uh, numbers. July, August, September, October, you can see the green lines last year. They far exceeded prior years. So that's going to be the story. They shouldn't make it a story, but I want you to know about it. You really should point out how luxury is surging though, because look, this is on the right-hand side. This is $1,250,000 plus. This is the top 10% threshold out of, as of January 1st of this year. The top 10%. You see this on the right-hand side? This is ugly. <laughs> you might think this is great. However, it's not really sustainable to have this kind of a fast market in the upper end for a super long period of time. Green was last year. That's number of close uh, sales. Red is this year. Red is just absolutely insane. July 2021 is at 696, up 63% over last year. And last year was already a, a record uh, month last year at this time. That's 269 more. Last month, in the month of June, that was the most ever. We eclipsed 800 in San Diego. We're just right about 700, just under it. It's 696. I think we're at 698, just shy of it in, in April. So we're right there. These are very, very high numbers. Just know that. And this has legs. This is the expected market time for luxury above 1.25 million. It is at 50 days. 50 day expected market time. That's a hot seller's market in luxury. I am not used to seeing this. What I am used to seeing, go backwards, you'll see, if you look at 2019 and, and the start of 2020, I'm used to seeing an expected market time above 150 days, not 50 days, 150 days plus. When we first went in this pandemic, it went above 300. And that's when you know things are slowing down. But look at it now, it's a 50 day expected market time. That's hot. Go to reportsonhousing.com. R-E-P-O-R-T-S, reportsonhousing.com, click on subscribe. It's $15 per month or $150 per year. You get a month free if you utilize the coupon code San Diego, one word, San Diego. I know it's not really one word, but that's what we have to do here. Just bear with me. And then I start my housing debrief Friday. I resume them. I, was, I took uh, about six weeks off because it was summer. And now we're, kids are going back into school. It's time to, to bring these things about. I've had people ask me, Stephen, when are you bringing these back? I can't wait to see them again. And uh, it's this Friday at 3 p.m. It's live on uh, Facebook, Reports on Housing, on YouTube at Reports on Housing. You got to check this out because uh, I, I still am hearing of, uh, I was in a uh, presentation yesterday where one of the ladies, her son just sold her house in Newport Beach because he's convinced the market's going to crash. I said, go back to my YouTube uh, channel and find the one on crash and send it to them. And just send it to them because it, they need to know that it's not going to crash. I, it made me almost tear, tear up knowing that somebody's going to sit on the sideline and think it's going to crash because that's ridiculous. The only thing that's going to set this thing into a crash is if we all of a sudden skyrocketed to 5% interest rates. That would pretty much demoralize our market. That's not going to happen, though. That's uh, absolutely not going to happen. So anyways, stay tuned. That's at three o'clock. Uh, q and A. I I can open it up to uh, some questions and answers. See a there's, bigger... a, there's a question in the uh, chat and also a, a kind of a statement in the chat. Uh, the statement is from uh, Pamela and it says, um, and I think she's talking about home sellers. They are also quitting because their companies are mandating the VAX. I have two listings because of this, people moving out of California. Yeah. Oh, and I want you to know, this is not a California thing. This is a United States thing. There's a, if you watch CNBC, you're going to see every, everybody across the board. There's a lot of big companies that are requiring this. And yeah, I'm not, I don't get into the politics of this whole thing. I get into the, uh, the nitty gritty. I was dealing with a lot more of the science back in the day and people thought I was getting political and I was just going, my gosh, I'm just a numbers guy. I like to look at data and science and all that stuff. So my whole family's vaccinated. I'm not judging anybody else that's out there. I'm wearing a mask because I have a little one that can't 
that has uh, many, many problems and is allergic to everything under the sun and we don't want him getting sick. So you'll see me in a grocery store with a mask on and people will shake their heads. So just know that, uh, that this does exist. I do want you to know that there's not a mass exodus out of California. The UC system did this giant study and found that that was a big fat lie perpetuated by the media and everybody else is talking about it because real estate agents will talk about people that are moving all that stuff. People move out of California all the time. People move into California. The number of move-ins is slightly off because of also the reshuffling of the ability to work wherever you want. And it's very, very costly, exactly what Nancy guess. Very, very costly. That's in it, that's really what the juxtaposition the issue is. But when you look at it, there it was getting more costly anyways. So there was this slight trajectory down, and the pandemic did nothing to it. It's just a slight, and it's so slight, it's not that big of a deal. And uh, so just know that there's not a mass exodus. Instead, California buys California. That's really what the theme is. There's a lot of people from the Bay Area that come down here. And there's also, and then they start looking at what you can afford along the coast. They go into San Diego County and go, well, I get more bang for my buck here. It's pretty right here. What's the difference between here and LA? Yeah, uh, I think it's a little bit better. Exactly, <laughs> so. that's a huge portion. Okay, so the next, uh, this is a question on the Q&A, which is, are there any numbers on corporate residential buyers versus homeowners or home owner occupied type buyers? Yeah, that's extremely hard, difficult uh, to, to follow. Uh, I don't like to follow some of these stats uh, through uh, all the fields that we get in the MLS. Unfortunately, some of them are off and they're mis misdone. It's very hard to actually do how many of these are corporate relocations. This would jive with a lot of people thinking that people are moving out of California. Just kind of uh, exhausted that, that there's not this mass exodus out of California that's any different than what we've seen in prior years. It's just now that when somebody has somebody that's moving out of the area and they're in an office meeting, they're saying, I have somebody that's moving out of California. Like as if that's a big thing. People have been doing it for decades. It's no different. I remember back in the 90s when I got into this thing and everybody's going, everybody's moving to Texas. I've heard that for a long time. I've visited Texas, pretty state. I don't want to live there long term. I, my brother and sister moved off to Wisconsin. That's great. They're part of that statistic. I went over there and took a look at them. I love it during the summertime. Uh, I can hit it in the fall. It's really pretty, but there are some times where you don't want to hit it. They, I get bit all the time, eaten by mosquitoes, and uh, they have a horrible winter where they have like negative 20 uh, below zero uh, freezing temperatures. I don't even know what that means. He said you can't breathe. I don't want to be a part of that. So there's a lot of people that are staying here in California, like me, you know, where I have to wear a sweater when it gets down to like 62. And other people yeah. come here and they're wearing flip-flops. I exactly. I'm a third generation native and I always say my blood's too thin to live anywhere else because I can't, I just can't adapt. That's too cold or too hot. I can um, visit it. <laughs> exactly. Wave at it politely from the car. Um, <laughs> Lenore has a, has a comment slash uh, comment. She said, this is so similar. And, and she actually moved here from the Bay Area. She's one of those people that decided it was much less expensive here. Um, this is so similar to how Silicon Valley went in the early 2000s but salaries followed the rise of housing in order to get workers to come there. Could that also happen here? Uh, well, we're already seeing, uh, like I was saying, it's not just here though, it's across the country. Who has it, the upper hand for the first time in a long time, it's the workers. There's, if, if you look around at, uh, and it's gonna make everything a little more expensive and you're gonna see this rebalancing, reshuffling act. Uh, I know that like uh, McDonald's, each one makes like a million dollars per year. So uh, they're gonna have to eat into that a little bit and pay their workers a little bit more. Uh, and that's really what's gonna happen because I've seen uh, a lot of fast food places, a lot of grocery store chains with a lot of help wanted. There's a lot of help wanted out there. For all those people to be unemployed and there be help wanted, it means that, you know what, We're they're gonna have to pony up in order to get these people to want to go ahead and flip a burger or uh, check somebody out at the at, at, as, a, as a cashier or something like that. They're, they're looking for something a little bit better. So I see this, this sweep up in, in salaries uh, that, that will somewhat keep up with it. And, and we've already seen it. I've seen it in the data that, that it's already starting. And I also understand that just in, with housing going up, something that I intentionally left out because we didn't have enough time is, is the uh, rents are going to be going up as well. So they already it, are. Yeah, they, they already, and, and it's because when you have values going up and people, you, you could just get away and there's the, the, to be able to rent out a house, they're, they're having the same issue. Go try to find a rental right now. Good luck.
Exactly. Well, and then the people are buying at a higher price. And then so the rents are going to have to reflect that. Yeah. Um, and then all the people that have held on to their properties and are still renting them are matching those numbers. So it really does just cross the board, go up, 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 um, which again, it's good if you're a homeowner, not so good if you're a home buyer. Yes. Which is why you need to pull the trigger. I think everybody says, when's a good time to buy? When it makes sense for your family to afford the, the payment that you want to take on for 30 years. Then do it and then don't care about it. Exactly. And to, to your point of what we were just talking about, rents are high. So you can either pay rent and pay somebody sure. else's mortgage that's high, or you can buy and pay your own mortgage. And that fix it. High. Yeah, but you're going to own it. So when's a good time to buy? How long are you going to live here? Buy. Exactly. It's a family decision. People say, is this a good time to buy? If you're asking that question, the answer is no. <laughs> Ask your dog. Because I'll tell you, I'll show you all the stats and figures that say that, yes, it is a good time to buy and all that stuff. And if you still come to the conclusion and wonder if it's still a good time to buy after I said that, then it's not a good time for you for whatever your reasons are. Well, and a lot of people, to your point about your kids, my kids are, my son just got engaged. He's getting married uh, next year and has a fantastic job. He's a, a firefighter in Orange County. His, his fiance works for Marvel. Um, both wow. of them have great jobs. They can't buy a house right now. It's too expensive. Um, they are going to have to save for a while to be able to make that down payment and all that other stuff, stuff that's, you know, kind of normal stuff, normal house stuff, but it's just that our numbers are higher. Uh, yeah. So it's not a good time if you don't have the money, but it is a good time to buy if you want to uh, retain value. Yeah. And that and millennials, millennials uh, don't, they want to skip the, the starter, the starter condo townhome and yeah. move right into a house. Yeah. They <laughs> We're just going to have a baby right live. away and we need the house. So that's exactly. <laughs> If they would have bought a condo a year and a half ago and kept that, then they can have that as a stepping stone to that house. And that's what I'm trying to explain to this younger generation. Just squeeze in there and then you ride that wave and then you, you turn that equity into something else. Exactly. That nothing turns over faster than a house um, to buy a house. And it, it, if you think back to most of us and our first houses and where we've lived, yes. to save money, uh, you know, it really does. And some of them, you know, those fixer uppers that were... <laughs> Um, you know, so I think sometimes that's, that's the sweat equity, uh, that you, you need to kind of go through. And I'm not sure this generation is, has gone through that. No. <laughs> well, when they want it bad enough, they'll do it exactly. <laughs> after they get married, she's pregnant. She's going to say, we're finding something, figure it out. <laughs> Talk to your mom. <laughs> pull that trigger right now, or I will pull a trigger. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, it does not look like we have more questions. You are so thorough that you've answered everything. Good. And uh, I am just so excited to have you here every time. And I'm so thrilled that you were able to uh, fit us in. I know you're great and the busy guy. And uh, with that family, you're busy. Just goodness, just at home. Um, and as the youngest of seven, I can relate. Um, <laughs> so I, I appreciate, I appreciate your time. I really appreciate the knowledge and the expertise. It is so helpful to us. Uh, and, and to your point earlier, it does help us look like we know what we're doing and, and that's always helpful. Um, and that's always appreciated when we're, you know, we're dealing with people who really, uh, there's a lot of fear out there and to have kind of the numbers and the details and the stats and things to be able to, to provide to people instead of just this kind of crazy wide-eyed, uh, lunatic fringe stuff that, that, everybody seems to repeat. And um, so it's nice to be able to have the actual stats and the numbers to go to go with uh, and I appreciate it. And somebody actually just asked if the recording will be posted. Yes, it'll be on the YouTube uh, channel for uh, North County. And I'll get you a copy of the presentation too. I'll send it right. your way or Carol's way. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Stephen. You have a fantastic day. Uh, and uh, stay cool. It's a little hot out there today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good one. Bye, everybody.